Welcome to Upon Walton Farm and welcome to my Ukrainian countdown. Um, it, we all know of the horrible situation in Ukraine and what Eastern Europe. Um, it spilled over to Poland and now there are Ukrainian refugees everywhere. And it's in, very in particularly important to my family. I'm half Ukrainian. Um, my father's parents, my grandparents on my father's side, were from Ukraine and they had immigrated to the United States after the Russian Revolution. Um, and so this is very, very traumatic for all of us um, because my other half of the family is Polish and it, it really is very dire. And so what I'm doing um, in my little way, I'm going to host uh, a zaskushki table. And what a zaskushki table is, is a beautiful spread like a buffet. And in Ukraine, it can be, it's rather elaborate. And you see this throughout Eastern Europe. And it's usually your zaskushki table is your hors d'oeuvres and things you have before the main meal. Um, I'm turning it into the main meal. So um, the first thing I'd like to make for you is vareniki which is probably the most famous Ukrainian dumpling there is. And we, in Poland, they're called pierogies. And Western Ukraine, they call them, I grew up uh, calling them uh, pierogi. And so there are many names throughout Eastern Europe for them and many, many, many recipes. And so we're gonna go through that today. So the first thing I want to do is I've been boiling potatoes. I'm gonna make the tr probably the most popular version, which are the um, pierogies that are uh, stuffed with um, mashed potatoes and cheddar cheese and some sauteed onions. And I'm doing the potatoes first because it has to cool. And they're boiling and they're just ready to come out of the pot. The interesting thing about cheese is these in Ukraine are called Americans because I'm using cheddar cheese and it became very popular for Ukrainians and who had immigrated to Canada and to North America when they discovered cheddar cheese, they loved it and started putting it in to their um, parohi or vareniki. And in Ukraine, they would usually use an aged ewe's milk cheese, believe it or not. That would be a little, it, it's pungent, sort of like cheddar. But also there are recipes where you use basically what we would call a farmer's cheese or a very kind of bland cheese. So I've chosen to use the cheddar and the first thing I'm going to do is remove the potatoes. Um, I The recipe calls for two and a half cups of mashed potatoes and what I'm doing is I'm saving my potato boiling water because uh, the vareniki have to be boiled after you make them and so I'm trying to reduce the amount of pots and everything I have. And so I'm just gonna put them into a bowl. They've been boiling, they're ready to go, and I'm using a strainer to scoop them out. And then I'm gonna put the water aside and reserve it for when I boil the vareniki to cook them and finish them. So I'm going to mash the potatoes, and I like to mash my potatoes in the sink. I also want to get this off the heat. Now, Vareniki are very, very versatile. There are so many versions of them. There are so many fillings. My favorite act actually is the sauerkraut filling. I love them filled with sauerkraut or kapusta. And, but another filling that's really, really good is mushroom. But you'll find there's a, a wonderful, we call them dessert vareniki, that are filled with sour cherries. Those are also very delicious. But you'll find things, ones filled with um, a finely minced meat or fish. And just about almost any situation, you're going to see there's a vareniki board. So I'm going to mash my potatoes, and I like to do it in the sink so that I don't get them anywhere. And I, you don't really need to add milk or anything like that. I, I am going to add some butter, probably two tablespoons of butter are going to go in. And I'm just going to whip the potatoes. And 
and I'm going to let them get cold. They have to be completely cold, and the butter does help. If you find, if you need to get this cool quickly, add some cold milk to them, and they'll cool off a lot faster. And so I'm just going to let these sit. Now let's talk about the onions. I am making more. For the mixture, we only really need, um, the recipe my grandmother used calls for one small onion chopped. But because I am going to serve them with melted butter and onions poured over, I'm doing all of my onions now. So I have chopped two large onions into, I'd say, not a mince, but a small dice and on the small side. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna put about a tablespoon of oil in my saute pan and let it get hot. And then I'm gonna add butter to it. The oil protects the butter. I will also say, <laughs> growing up in a Slavic household, we grew up in the Orthodox Church, in the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And <laughs> uh, maybe all our Roman Catholic friends would also know about this that we fast during Lent but in the Orthodox Church it's not just during Lent and it's not just on Fridays we fast three times a year the longest fast is Lent the Great Lent where we don't eat meat at all for the entire for the entire Lenten season literally um, and so what we have is we would not be using butter if this was make if this was a Lenten dish because it just didn't mean fasting from meat. We couldn't have dairy either, and so there are versions of this where you just use vegetable oil or olive oil, and um, also the filling we would have probably the kapusta or sauerkraut filling, or you could do the potato filling. It just would not be with you would not use butter. Um, you would have to saute things in oil. So that's just an interesting fact <laughs> about why we have so many in Ukrainian on uh, Eastern European cuisine, also Middle Eastern, anywhere where there's a lot of Orthodox Christians, um, you're going to have a tremendous amount, and it's really quite good and healthy for you, vegetarian food. Because half, literally half of the year, because there are three fasts in the year, we don't eat meat. And so... In some ways, it's very, very healthy for you. I'm starting it over high heat. Um, and just to get it going. And so I'm going to put all of my onions in. This is two large onions, um, small dice. And we're just going to add them to the oil and butter. And I'm going to put about half a teaspoon of salt just to help them sweat. And I do think it actually aids in the caramelization. So what I just put in were two big pinches, which I think is about a half a teaspoon, and just get them going up to temperature. The reason I have to start on my uh, boiling plate, I'm working on an auger. And so we just want to get the onions going. I am going to cover them, that will help a bit. And then I will keep them covered when I sweat them. Um, the, the Zaskushki table, talking about it, um, really, we always had one for important events. Like if it was um, what a lot of the Westerners would call First Holy Communion, we call it First Penance, um, there would be a big event. Or, you know, if it was a wedding or some type of party, always Christmas and Easter, um, there would be... Zaskushki. And on the table, there is almost always something in aspect. And my sister and I, when we were young, and especially when we would have these events at church, we would, all, we would always stay away from that. Because usually it was pig's feet in aspic, or <laughs> it was a whole fish and in the gelatin. And we just thought meat jelly or fish jelly, we're running away from it. Um, over the years, I de it is delicious, actually. And a lot of people get scared of Julia Child's chapter of Aspects. Um, they're not popular anymore. They're still popular in Eastern Europe. Um, and there are some good aspects. Later on this week, I'm going to show you an aspect 
that is a champagne aspect and it's delicious and I'm going to use it to mold a vegetable salad with asparagus and it works beautifully and it's tremendously refreshing and a Zaskushki table really wouldn't be complete without an aspect because it is impressive and it is beautiful and I'm also going to share with you the table the setting of it because on a Zaskushki table it's usually beautifully decorated with flowers and you usually put your best of everything out um, whatever your best dishes are your best cutlery you name it it goes on the Zaskushki table another thing that is common to the Zaskushki table and we would really only have it for holidays and special occasions would be caviar and I'm going to talk about this week domestic caviar and I'm also going to use a caviar that was farmed and raised in France because right now we know um, most everyone is knows that really good beluga caviar comes from Russia of course and for right now I really think I want to use um, caviar that's domestic and you're going to be surprised if you try the caviars I'm going to show you um, they're very good and they're close they're if not I, a caviar connoisseur would, I'm sure, be able to tell the difference. But um, what's great about the caviars I'm using from France and from the United States is they are responsibly farmed um, and they are from sturgeon. And, you know, we figured out how to raise sturgeon, you know, outside of Russia. They're, you know, so that I think is going to be interesting. What I do want to show you next, while the onions are reducing, I got, I'm really excited. It's the first time I'm going to use my cheese, my new cheese grater. And um, we need a cup of shredded cheese. So I'm going to show you how I'm going to use that just right. So here's my new cheese grater. <laughs> and um, it is from Fantase. And it says from since 1906. And um, they're Philadelphia. Uh, they're from the family is still the business is still owned and operated and they sell all sorts of kitchen things and especially anything that's related to Italian cookery so this is my new cheese grater I'm so excited you are seeing the inauguration of the cheese grater so I read the instructions and it's pretty simple you press and you turn and it does what's great is it has a suction cup with a handle and it it will adhere to your counter I I'm assuming it can adhere to any counter. This is a granite counter. I'm sure it adheres to Formica as well or whatever. And so we just turn and it's going in nicely. Oh, there we go. It does work. This is great. I think I'm going to start though with my hand only because this is a cheddar and it's crumbling a bit. So I'm going to just put it aside. A really hard trip uh, cheese like a Gruyere, I'm sure would not crumble quite like that. And so, yep, there we go. Isn't that fun? I love it. I'm so glad I got it. Because I've been doing so much cooking with my new hobby, doing these vlogs. And I used to grate cheese the old fashioned way, just with a handheld grater. And I was like, you know what? With the amount of cooking I'm doing, it, I thought this would be a good investment. And I don't remember it being very expensive at all. I think it was under $40. And look at that, it works perfectly. My cheese is ready for the potato mixture. And I am gonna add it now. So let me put you back up so you can we can see each other. And I'm gonna add it now while the potatoes are still warm so it has a chance to melt. Um, so we don't get glue later. And I'm just mixing it in. So today reminds me of my childhood a great deal. My sister and I, when we were little, I think I've already told you how much we grew up in the kitchen with my mother and grandmother. And Fridays in particular, because Friday was always a fast day, even if you were outside of Lent or one of the fasts, Friday was pierogi making day. And so my Polish grandmother, this is her recipe, and I checked the Ukrainian recipes, and there are several that are identical, and there are also other ones too. So my my mother and grandmother always would put my sister and I to a very specific task. And our task was to seal or pinch the pierogies. And so the kitchen smells of my childhood right now, the boiling potatoes, the sauteing onions. 
I feel like my grandmother is sitting right here next to me telling me what to do because she always told us what to do. So I, so we're going to come back in a few after the onions um, have uh, sweated and are ready to combine. While the onions are sweating and sauteing, I'm going to make the dough. So what I've put into this bowl is two cups of regular all-purpose unbleached flour. And to that, I'm going to add two teaspoons of salt. and I'm just eyeballing it, um, you can measure. And you wanna mix that around just so that you don't have a concentration of it anywhere. And this dough is really simple. The one thing is once we start adding the wet ingredients and when we get to the part where we need to roll it, you don't wanna overwork your dough because if you have pierogies that you feel like can sink the Titanic, or Varenike that can seek the Titanic, it's because the dough has been worked too much. And people have all sorts of tricks. There are doughs that I've seen in books, and then I, my grandmother even made a version where it, for the liquid, it was sour cream. So, so now I've made my dough. Now what I did for the dough, all it is, is two cups of flour, two egg yolks, um, two tablespoons of butter, two teaspoons of salt, and I've put it into the bowl and I've mixed it and I just used a wooden spoon. Now what I have done and been doing is I'm gradually adding cold water to make, to help it form a dough. And what you need to do is add it gradually. A tablespoon at a time is what my grandmother's re recipe is. That's why she says, only and you see we have a ball that it's formed okay now what we're going to do is after it's kneaded and it doesn't have to be kneaded that long okay i'd say no more than five minutes because you don't want to overwork the dough and then the dough needs to rest because you've just worked all this gluten and now you need to let it rest so we're going to cover it again what i had was two cups of flour two teaspoons of salt i mixed that around together added two egg yolks and started mixing with a wooden spoon. You can do this in your food processor. It works perfectly fine. And then after I put in two tablespoons of melted butter and then gradually cold water, but only the amount you need. And so my onions, now I'm gonna show you the saute. Well, my onions are at the point where they're just beginning to caramelize and that's where I want them, just a little bit of brown. And so I'm gonna show them to you and I'm gonna add them to the potato mixture. So if we look at this, they've caramelized, and I, I have used, I usually don't, I used what I had on hand, which is basically what my grandmother did. Um, usually I use a Vidalia onion, a sweet onion, but what I had, I had one Vidalia and the other onion was a red onion, so that's why it's a little bit more colored than usual. And you want to put, I would say I'm putting two hefty tablespoons of onions in that have been sauteed. And then just reserve the onions because we're going to use this to dress the vareniki at the end. So I just put them aside, keep them warm, and I'm just going to mix it now. I'm going to still use the blender. It's you, want to make sure, you want to make sure it's very well mixed. You want every Varenike to have a little bit of onion in it. And this looks really, really good. And I'm going to finish it with a spoon. There's a friend of mine who told me to mash my potatoes or anything that I'm going to blend to put it in the sink. And what a great idea. You think I've never thought of that ever before. And so I'm going to just stir it with a spoon and just to make sure it's fully combined. And so if you look, we have a nice, beautiful potato mixture and it has to get cold. It may actually, to this, I would say is probably more like two, uh, three and a half cups. What my grandmother and mother would do with leftover potato with uh, pierogi filling is they would make little cakes out of it and just fry the filling and it was really delicious. What is important is to taste it. 
because at this point, once you put it inside the Varenikes, you can't do anything about it. So you want to taste it to see if it needs some salt and pepper. It's very good. I do think it needs salt. And for the filling, we have two large potatoes mashed, one onion finely chopped, and you saw I actually did a lot of onions and then put two hefty tablespoons in. Um, one tablespoon of butter, um, a half tablespoon, or if you don't use butter, use oil, and one cup of grated, I'm using cheddar cheese, and then salt and pepper to taste. I do think it needs salt. And I am gonna put some pepper in. So, I'm having a lot of fun today. My mother loved pepper. I always thought she over peppered her food. Even at the table, she would add more um, and give it a really good stir and then taste it again. And so I'll use a fresh spoon to taste. Because you want them, you, after you go through all of this trouble, and it isn't that hard. I mean, you're seeing that the dough is simple. Um, that's really good. So I added a little extra salt, and that was perfect. And just set it aside. And that is actually now cool enough to work with. The dough has been resting, and I want to see how it is. It's still a little sticky, and it is a sticky dough. So just be aware of that. Now, what I do, here is where you want to minimize on flour, because the more flour you use, the tougher your dough is going to be. So I'm going to add flour gradually, okay? So I, I spread out a work surface here so you can see. And I'm just going to first sprinkle a little on the top so I can just lift it out and work with it. And the resting, as I said, it's very important. Then on your board, you're going to put some flour. And we're going to do this gradually. So pick it up, get around it. It comes together quite easily, actually, into a ball. A lot of people put a little drop of olive oil or some type of you probably better would be some type of vegetable oil, something that has no flavor at all in the bottom of the bowl before you put your dough in and it'll come out nice and easy. Um, but just a little bit because you don't want that affecting the dough. And so here I have my mass of dough. And first I'm just gonna roll it a little bit in the flour and I just put not even a tablespoon of flour down on the board. Now I'm gonna add more to, to roll it. and. I'll be back with you in a second because I want to adjust the camera so you can see how it Now goes. it's time to start rolling the dough. So I'm going to put a little bit of flour on my sheet. You can do this on marble, your granite, anything. I actually, to be, I have granite countertops, but I'm using a sheet because it minimizes the mess. All I have to do is just wash this. It's a thin, um, I think it's silicone or silicone. I love it, I use it for all my baking and then there, there's only there's not much mess. So lightly flour it again on this. And the great thing about using this, or if you use a cold surface, the great thing is uh, Julia Child used to have a sheet of marble she kept in her um, refrigerator, pulled it out because if the marble's nice and cold, nothing really will stick to it. And so I am gonna put a little bit of flour on my rolling pin, again, so the dough doesn't stick to it. And then we're gonna roll it out. and we're gonna roll it out very thin. It really needs to be thin. And try not to work the dough too much. The more you work with this, the tougher it will become. And so I need to move this over a little bit. And then I'm gonna turn it again, just to get a different position on it. It's an easy dough to work with, you just again, Try not to add flour, only if you absolutely have to. And again, we're rolling it really thin. My grandmother's kolache recipe, see this is still too thick and it's pretty thin. Her, the dough for the kolache cookies, if any of you know what those are, they're like little rolled up or bow type cookies filled with poppy seed or nut filling 
or jams, apricot, and lacbar was my favorite, which is a prune corn. It's still my favorite. And so that, it's getting there. It's still not thin enough. Watch for any tears because you don't want to tear in your bow or your renegade, whatever you want to call them. They're still the same. And that's about, you want to feel it. I still want it a little bit thinner. Now I am making little ones. We, my grandmother would use a glass about the size of a canning jar. And I'm using something a little bit smaller. I'm using this because these are going to be on a zaskushki table. And we don't want to have huge pierogies. You need something that can basically be eaten just with a fork. And so I am making them small. And you just put whatever you're making them out of, you twist and turn. That's it. And then I'll show you how we close them up. So we go through this. We keep turning. In the meantime, I put that hot water back on because as soon as I make them, they're going to go into boiling water and that's how we finish cooking them. After that, also, I think it's important to note, put a little oil in your serving dish or whatever you're going to keep them in until you finish them, just so that they don't stick together. These freeze, I'm sure you have all seen in the supermarkets, uh, Frozen pierogies, they're really a nice quick thing to, to just be able to go home and do. I will say though, if you make if you make these, you, you're gonna probably buy those frozen things a lot less because the taste of a homemade vareniki or pierogi is, there's no comparison. There just isn't. And so over the whole sheet, I'm making my circles and I'm twisting because this particular thing, a glass would probably be easier because it would have uh, a more finished edge. This, because it's it's like porcelain or something, it you have to turn just to make sure it separates from the dough. And this dough does look perfect. It's nice and elastic. It's not too overflowered. And then all we do now is we're gonna take a teaspoon each of the mixture and put it in each of them, just like this. And so I'm gonna start at this end. I don't want that to come together. And then I'll show you what my sister and I did. And so I'm gonna put a teaspoon of each. Ooh, that's a little much. I would say if you're making them this size, literally a teaspoon, not too much because you don't want them to burst when you boil them. So just a little bit. The great way about doing it this way too is you can make sure you have a little bit of the onion in there because the onion I love, that's where the flavor I think is. The cheese of course is good too. And so we just keep finishing the process. It's very simple. And I'll pinch one or two of them for you. And then we'll come back and see how they boil. I haven't, I haven't done this in years. I hate to say it. That's a little too much. And this really is bringing back a lot of childhood memories. It really was what my sister and I learned from my grandmother and our mother really was a great deal. They really taught us a lot. And you know, when you get older, you then really appreciate what your parents did for you and the things they taught you. Um, and so everyone there, share your recipes, share your traditions with your kids because they will treasure it forever. And so just a little bit. And I will say, it, this is the longest process of making them. The dough is easy. All you have to do is mash some potatoes and fry some onions. If you have leftover mashed potatoes from the dinner, save them. Just put them in the refrigerator and you can make pierogies out of them or vareniki. And that's one less step. So if you know in advance if you're going to have a pierogi making day, 
make some extra mashed potatoes and then you're done. So now these are ready to be folded. And so I'm gonna do one here at the end so you can see. All you do is you flip it over, let the dough come off, and you just close it up. You don't need to use water or anything to make the seams come together. It's literally that simple. And we just pinch. With our, this is how we did it when we were kids. We just pinch the ends. And here I'll do another one for you. And the dough is a little bit sticky. And if you're having any problems with that, just dip your fingers in some water, preferably some cold water, and that'll take care of it. Okay, and I'm gonna do the rest in well, a minute. The pierogies or the vareniki are all ready, and I had to do them in two shifts. And so what to do is, once you have a grouping of them done, cover them with a kitchen towel so that they don't get hard. And now what we're going to do, I'm using the same potato water that I use to boil my potatoes in. And I don't have to salt it, it's already salted. If you were just, if you hadn't done that, you should salt the water, <clears throat> I would say with about half a teaspoon. And so you'll see when they're fresh like this, they cook very, very quickly. And what I have ready is some butter in a serving dish because I'm gonna get them ready to serve. So all you do is you plunge them into the boiling water gently. I did put a little bit of flour on the dish so they wouldn't stick to the dish, and that should come off in the cooking process. You don't want to put too many in because you don't want to crowd the vareniki. You want to give them a chance to cook, and you don't want them to stick either. So a few at a time, and then give it a stir so they don't stick to the bottom. And my sauteed onions are over here on the side. And so I'm just giving a light stir and they detach beautifully from the bottom of the pan, so I'm gonna add more. When they float to the top, they're done. And that's when you transfer them to your serving dish. Or if you're going to freeze them, put them on you know, a baking sheet or something and just let them cool down. And you can freeze them in plastic bags. These freeze great. Just like the frozen ones you would buy at the store. And again, trust me, if you make your own, you will buy the store-bought ones a lot less. And again, the hardest step with this was filling them. So, you know, it took me maybe a half hour to fill all of them. And as you're going through them, make sure they're sealed, okay, or else they will open up. And so I'm just gonna let them come to a boil and that's it. Today has been really a walk down memory lane and so I'm just, Give a little stir. There aren't some of them are already starting to float. Um, so I'm going to bring my dish close, and you want the water to return to a simmer, not a rolling, rolling boil. You should start with a rolling boil, uh, just so they're hot enough, and then we're gradually just going to take them out. And really, they're quite lovely. So when they float they're done. So I'm gonna continue doing this and I'm gonna, we'll be back in a few seconds and I'll now show you. the last batch of Vareniki are ready. And so I'm gonna pull them out and I'm gonna show you how I finish them. And they puff up quite a bit. And so what I'm gonna do, just so things don't stick, I am gonna put, it really was, they move nicely. It was worth putting the butter in. And I remember my mother and my grandmother doing this is I am gonna put a little bit of the onion mixture because we're gonna have layers of this. And so that'll also help. The great thing about these is you can make them in, in advance. And if you put them in the butter and onions like this, you could put them in the refrigerator and wait for when, wherever your dinner or your party is. And then just stick them in the oven. I would let them come to room temperature and then 20 minutes in probably a 350 degree oven and you're ready, you might have to drizzle a little bit more butter on top of them. Um, but these really, they remind me of my youth. <laughs> these are beautiful, I can't wait to show them to you. Um, some people will garnish it with parsley, I've seen it done that way too, um, with the onions. And again, 
if it's if you're on a fast or if you can't if you have a dairy problem oil olive oil is fine it tastes very good with these um, a slightly different flavor but it's very very good and so I'm just spooning them out I'm using a little tiny my little strainer you see me this little tool which is probably 50 cents I use for everything it's just perfect I strain my sauces I do everything with it and these they look just like I remember them. And again, I have not made this in probably 25 to 30 years. And so I'm gonna take my cup of my butter. I just wanna warm it up a little bit um, and get it a little melted because it's been sitting. And they're, they really are lovely. And you really, with a salad, you have a meal here, and if you don't use the butter, other than the eggs, you have a completely uh, vegetarian meal. I would look up, I, I'm sure you could use a non-dairy substitute for the eggs, because the dough is a very flexible recipe. Um, and, you know, it's a very simple dough. So, I advise everyone to make some pierogies of Reineke. And again, the fillings, um, I'll provide online in the notes some of the other fillings. The sauerkraut are delicious. Um, so are the uh, sour cherry um, and mushroom are really, really, really good. And so this is just coming back up to, to bubble and I'm just getting it melted so that everything goes on nicely. And I'm, I have part one of the Zaskushki table ready. Now I only have other, I have a lot more work to do. <laughs> I'm going to be doing um, a pate, um, which I think I'm gonna, really, I'm gonna, it's gonna be more of a French pate. And I'm gonna create somewhat of an international Zaskushki table. It'll be primarily Ukrainian, but um, there's pashit, which is a liver, pate kind of paste that's traditional um to serve the other thing i'm going to do is make um nalasniki which are um ukrainian pancakes they're basically like a french crepe and they're going to be for some salmon and caviar and i'm also going to do the mushroom filling that you can uh serve with them which is really really delicious so that people who necessarily don't like um smoked salmon and caviar, there is the option then to have, you know, something else. And these just look beautiful, just gorgeous. I'm gonna show them to you in a second. So we're gonna get all the onions out and we're just pouring them over, we're just spreading them all around, a little bit on every single area. And it just smells wonderful. There's nothing, you know what I love the smell of, and I guess I grew up with onions, always sauteing, and cabbage too. We ate a lot of cabbage growing up, and I still do. Cabbage is great for you. And I will do a halupsi, or some people call it halupki in Poland. Um, Guamki is another Polish name for it. And that's stuffed cabbage. And there's many versions of that too, because we have meatless versions where it is completely vegan completely there the every ad uh, there is no animal fat or anything in them so they look absolutely lovely and i want to show them to you and i think i'm just going to serve them exactly the way they are isn't that lovely and they look great on a buffet garnish it with parsley to put it on a buffet and i might do that what i want to do now with you is taste one because i have not had a homemade vereniki in at least 25 years I've had them, you know, where they make them at church and things. So I'm going to pick one that maybe is the not one of the prettier ones. I was lucky. I didn't have any of them burst. And so I want to get a little more onion. I'm going to taste it. I can't wait. They look exactly like my grandmother's. Mmm. Skip the frozen food section in the grocery. Don't do it. Make these. <laughs> this is so delicious. Mm. 
perfect. So I hope everybody starts making Vereniki. Send your thoughts and prayers. And if you can help with your time, talent, or treasure in any way, the people of Ukraine, please do it. They're in great need at this time. You necessarily, if you, you can't financially help them, you can help them in other ways. Um, see if there are any local organizations packing um, toiletry supplies, packing clothing, or if you can donate clothing. Um, they're in need of just about everything. So remember Ukraine, and this whole week, we're going to be celebrating Ukraine, and we're going to have a great Zaskushki table. <laughs>